You know, there are times when, uh, when you reach a certain age plateau where the, uh, the producers say, they talk about you and they say, well, what do you think? Can we risk it? Can we do it? Can we use him? The other guy says, I don't know, let's look at some younger ones. We can make them look older, but this one, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult. They forget, they forget to ask that you go out there and you do all these things. Like, for instance, you know, you go out there and you do these... That's, that's, that's nothing really. As far as the two-handed push-ups are concerned, you can do that all night. And it doesn't make any difference whether she's there or not. Howdy there, listening people. Howdy, howdy. Yeehaw, Bartek. How howdy, you howdy, oh, howdy, oh. howdy, howdy. Howdy. That's a reference. That's a, re- rep- that's rep- a reference to our first ever episode. <laughs> <laughs> do I have Boomhauer in the room with me? Gee whiz. Dang old Boomhauer, man. So, Bartek, we are Spitting Polish Presents. That's right, Ryan. And we are always spitting, and we both happen to be Polish. Do you have any pieces of Polish trivia to bring to this episode? Any Polish facts? Anything about Polish culture, perhaps? Or traditions? Or anything personally? Well, because Polish people have existed throughout history and, you know, they've reproduced... We... <laughs> Unlike other people who have not existed throughout history. Yes, well, fun fact, Polish people have done that as well. Um, we managed to get a guy who, despite having a completely different name, went by a screen named Jack Palance. Mm-hmm. That, yes. That's a fact that I've been holding for many years, just waiting to throw on you, Ryan. He had some Ukrainian and Estonian there, yeah, too. Yeah, Volodymyr P. Wow, 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 we wow. And we are doing... That was almost Borat. Yes, I I didn't want to go full. I know Sasha's listening and I didn't want him to sue me. So we are here to talk about movies that come recommended on our show. Pictures Pow Wow, the original PP, as we like to call it. Well, I like to call it Pitta (laughs) Papa. Do you want to speak English in this, or do you want to speak your gibberish for that one? Well, that one was deliberate. But... Yeah, I know it's deliberate this time. <laughs> I wish I could remember how I said it at the beginning of this episode. Give me a five-star review for that sentence I just said. So, uh, we are talking... They'll give it three talking... stars and complain about oh, me. <laughs> yeah, about you and your name and how it's said like it's spelled or whatever. Whoever wrote that review, I have my own mic now. Yes, so we are here to talk about a movie that one of our listening people recommended. Uh, we go in order of you recommend a movie, Bartek, then I recommend a movie, then the listening people recommend a film. So people out there, you can shoot us a message on our social medias or email directly to let us know movies that you think we should check out. We'll add it to the list, or in this case, I'll write it down on a piece of paper, and then I'll put it to the side, and then I'll find it again months and months and months later. But I found it, Magellan. Magellan, a friend and uh, uh, the host of our spin-off podcast, Chats, the television podcast, a show that talks about, well, television shows. They're currently going through uh, Sense8, the uh, J. Michael Straczynski and Wachowski uh, production that was on Netflix a few years back. Uh, uh, Magellan recommended City Slickers, the Billy Crystal film. So people, if you have not seen City Slickers before, it's always good to watch the films for yourself, get a feeling of it. But this is a pretty simple Hollywood comedy, a uh, midlife crisis movie, uh, people finding themselves. You, If you have not seen the film, you, you may have seen the film because it's been riffed on so many times since it's come out. The Simpsons basically did a whole episode of this, including with Cookie and everything, where it's about these guys who are... Uh, getting older in their life and they need to find purpose so wouldn't you know it the goofy friend gets them uh gets them uh some uh, i guess what would you call it some tickets or some uh well it, it's a it's a like kind of a program yeah uh, program or not quite a tool but it's an ex- yeah experience where you first hand uh 
cattle help, ranch. Help herd some cows from one place to another. And learn how to ride horses and yeah. do the ropes, yeah. tricks. The line, the lines is like, stuff. you came here as city slickers and you're going to leave as cowboys over that, the course of two weeks. And now imagine that, but with Billy Crystal zingers, okay? With, with uh, Monsters Inc. himself. Mm-hmm. Zingers. So check it out. Uh, City Slickers is a classic. I have seen this film many times. There are certain moments of this that are burned into my brain, and uh, certain actors that I will forever look fondly at because of their roles in this film, such as uh, our boy from Very Bad Things and uh, Home Alone, Daniel Stern, mm-hmm. is in this. And I, I didn't. I don't know if I mentioned it in uh, very bad things, but oh, when I think about Daniel Stern, I always kind of forget about Home Alone because I think of stuff like City Slickers or I think of stuff like Very Bad Things. Okay. And he looks different in Home Alone, like he has the big hair. While in this movie and in Very Bad Things, he has a shorter hair. He's a lot more like angry dad figure who's got glasses, who just is like one step away from just having a complete meltdown in every single scene he's in. Well, in Home Alone, like, he's that, but he's the goofier one next to Joe Pesci, who kind of fits that mold a little bit more in my memories. But uh, overall, City Slickers is a bona fide classic. I haven't watched it in a while, but when I watched it last night, it all came flooding back. It's one of those films where... Basically, if you've seen it enough times, you just know how those scenes play out one after the other, the beats of the story and the jokes, but I still had a fairly enjoyable time. Nothing groundbreaking, but it's one of those films where I sat back and go, went, they don't make a lot of these anymore. Yeah, it felt like something that I wouldn't have seen in these this day and age. Even down to the opening credits with the animated cowboy lassoing the the names, that really took me back to my childhood with films like Drop Dead Fred would do something similar. Or even back further, we had the whole Pink Panther movie series where the opening credits were a part of the experience of seeing the movie. Well, come on, Ryan. We did Next Friday this year. That had an animated opening. Yes, yes. <laughs> Was it Next Friday or Friday After Next? I know Friday After Next had an uh, well, animated next, one. Well, it's because I used uh, the thumbnail for the episode on YouTube. It was like Ice Cube is an animated character That's right. like, falling misfortune over him. Oh, and we we also had the animated opening segment in the other Ice Cube movie, the... Uh... Um, why am I forgetting it? The one where he has to move out to the country and build a house? Is this the same film we're that's talking about? That's next Friday. <laughs> no, that's not a Friday movie. Friday... Oh, no, that's renovating a house. No, yes. Friday is when he's moving across... He has to go across the Oh, street. sorry, are we done yet? Are that's, we done yet? That's what I've been talking about this whole time, but I called it next Friday. That's why you're confused. My, mis- my mistake. Friday After Next had an animated opening yes. credit sequence. For these people out there listening, these are movies that we've covered on the podcast. Uh, pretty much every movie we just went through, we've done on the podcast that have an animated opening sequence. But Not next Friday, though. Uh, what... <laughs> Yeah, you made me confused. Like, did it not? <laughs> I think I just remember him giggling high as it's because music we, played. It's because we've done a lot of Ice Cube films this year. So what about you, City Slickers? Any familiarity, history, relationship? I think when I was younger, I might have seen the ending of the sequel. Oh, The Legend of Curly's Gold. Yeah. So I, I think based on what little I remember of that, like, you know, towards the end of the film... They're in some sort of, like, cave or something. Mm -hmm. And so I guess just growing up and having those vague memories, I assume that the City Slickers duology was about, I don't know, guys looking for treasure or something. So even though I'd heard of City Slickers, I didn't exactly know what the main point of it was, that it's like, you know, midlife crisis, these guys who are husbands, uh, you know, trying to get some enjoyment in their life. Um, so I walked into this, not blind, but with, uh... Certain expectations. Certain expectations, or uh, but in a very general sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know how acclaimed this film was. Obviously, it had a sequel. I even told you at the end of the last episode that uh, Jack, Jack Palance won an Oscar for this. Yeah, and that was a really interesting thing to hear. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Did you watch... I, I made a bet at the end of last episode that you wouldn't, 
But did you watch his acceptance speech at the Oscars? That was the thing I said to do. No, you know what? I didn't do that. But I remembered hearing like、oh, Ryan was saying to watch some Oscar speech. Was that Ryan? Or was that someone else? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Because、uh, yes,、uh, Curly in the movie Jack Jack Palance, he won an Oscar after having been owed one for a very long time. Many would say that he didn't deserve an Oscar for this movie, but it was a we have to give him one、right, yeah. type of affair. Now I don't necessarily think that's the case, but I can see the validity to that argument. And、uh, he proceeded to make a speech about how it's, you can still cast old people in movies. You don't need to cast young people looking like old people in movies because we're still fit and with it. And then he proceeded to do a、um, one-handed push-up set on the stage, <laughs> and then get back up and give more of his speech without. Being out of breath or anything, just proving that he's strong and fit. And then movies after that, like there's an animated movie that he does a voice in. His character is doing one-armed push-ups <laughs> and stuff like that because he can. So it's a nice little. It's it's completely insane, by the way. He he's a completely insane Oscar speech, but God love it. You, yeah, it's well, one、I、of those you gotta watch. Have to watch it now. Yeah, I think I read I, all I read about it was like in the trivia he quoted. One of his lines from the film, and everyone was like shocked because they didn't know it was a reference. It's one of the like, more memorable like a, lines. I can crap bigger than Billy Crystal or something.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, what did you think? I had a really good time with it. This was a really fun film. It it felt like a very straightforward, like oh yeah, I I could see in an alternate universe where I'd seen this film before and I hear it be recommended. I'm like oh well, there's a solid episode we can do. That's a good film. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very decent. It, it is a little long. I was surprised by that. Yeah, but it didn't feel its length、uh, quite it, so much. And this is the point. But it does drag when you're waiting for them to finally go to the ranch. I'd probably yeah, I'd probably all the stuff. I'd probably feel that on a second viewing. But、uh, there's a there's there's a reasoning for that in the script. You have to hammer in how dreary and miserable and sad and cantankerous and falling apart each one of these guys' lives are, or seemingly. Uh, so then you can have that exhilaration when you go from the city to the ranch and to the cattle and to all the wacky new characters we're going to meet. But、uh, yeah, I, I I think it's very good.、Uh, it, it's a formulaic Hollywood comedy film with Billy Crystal doing exactly what you want him to do, making little jabs and quips and. Uh, statements along the way, and being the pessimist in the room, full of、uh, either optimists or idiots, or just people who are about to explode. You're worried about, like with Billy Crystal, always in his movies, how his mouth is going to get them into trouble. Now, I I jokingly mentioned before, but Monsters Inc. is for for people of our age, what many would know、He's、Billy、Mike、Crystal. Wazowski, yeah. yeah, many would know Billy Crystal for in in our age range, and say people in my sister. His age range would know him for City Slickers, and you go on and on and on. And obviously, he hosted the Oscars like a billion times. So we, as、uh, people, also would remember him for that. Like he was the guy that always did the sketches where they insert Billy Crystal into Lord of the Rings and stuff. But his characters oftentimes are the smart Alec, and you worry it's like what dangerous scenario is his smart Alecy way is going to get us into now. Just put that, but put it in a cowboy setting, and here we are with city slickers. It's, <laughs> it's not a complex film. It's not the deepest film. I wouldn't even say it's the funniest film, but it is one of those movies where it is a quintessential example of how a safe Hollywood comedy film can really just hit you. It's just one of those things where. We talked about this a little while ago with some friends of ours. We're doing a a podcast guest spot that will come out in a, a few weeks from now. But oh、uh, yeah, early December. We're talking、uh, with our friends at the Contrarians about、uh, Hollywood studio comedies, especially of this era and how same year I think by the way, nineteen ninety one. Nineteen ninety one, where you have something like Nothing But Trouble, which is like an insane, bizarre, abstract, off the wall thing, and then you have City Slickers. Which is, it's what you need it to be. This is a perfect movie to play with your family. 
in the holidays or on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. They, they, they serve their function. Yeah, it's got like little heartwarming moments. It's got like cute little moments. Um, you know, I did have one or two laugh out loud moments, but even outside of them, like the comedy worked for me. I was like, oh yeah, that's a good one. What were your laugh out loud moments? Uh, what were your lol moments? My lol moments. <laughs> if I wasn't already lying in bed, I'd go so far as to say, you know, lamau or wow. Or, no, sorry, ruffles. What I was thinking of. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, roll in bed, laughing maybe. Yeah. Rubble. Um, the big one for me was, ironically, the sequence that ends with Jack Palance dying because the <laughs> the beginning of it was just you know after they'd bonded mm-hmm. and they're they're having like lunch with the other people and there's just this sequence of like. The, the ice cream guys, like, talking about, like, oh, he can predict ice cream for after any meal, and they just have, like, this intense standoff. <laughs> yeah, he and throws then, the plate. Yeah, and then they follow it up with, like, talk about, like, baseball with, like, the, the woman, and mm-hmm. it was just a really good conversation there. Yeah, really genuine. Yeah, so it's a mix of laughter and, like, oh, this is actually pretty well written. Yeah. And then it ends on a sad note, but yeah. A funny sad note, though, because... It was played for laughs. It's yeah. played for laughs. Like, it's not genuinely sad that this character's died, but it's funny. Like, oh, okay. And then you have Daniel Stern remarking, you always ate bacon. You can't You can't do that. You can't do that. So what's which part of it? Was it just the reveal that he died that made you laugh? No, well, it was the, the, the ice cream, like the... The, ice cream the standoff. intense standoff with yeah him, and then Billy Crystal raises a great point. Like, how do we know? <laughs> like, <laughs> how do we know? This yeah, is I, right was, or wrong? I was waiting for that. Like, okay, so what, what's the eventual qualifier? But no, they just take it at face value. Like, all right, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> and, like Billy Crystal's like flummoxed. He's like, oh, okay, like just how antagonistic that guy got. <laughs> there's no way you can beat this argument because they believe it. <laughs> so what's the point? What was your other laugh out loud moment? You said you had a couple. I think it was just multiple times in that sequence, but I'm sure there might have been one more somewhere in there. I uh, I had a good uh, chuckle at um, when uh, Daniel Stern, when his wife, like, were arguing in front of everybody and they ripped the phone out of the wall and Billy Crystal's like, that's my phone! <laughs> <laughs> you see the chunk of the wall come out and just Billy Crystal's just wincing in pain, like, that's my phone! I enjoy that whole sequence where we have uh, a surprise actress come in <laughs> to tell us how young she is and how she's probably pregnant with Daniel Stern's baby mm. and, I, and I instantly knew who it was. I, I was like, I know this face because she... She has a specific <laughs> look. And then as soon as she spoke out loud, I'm like, oh, there she is. I knew it, but I needed to hear the voice. Yeah, just I think the fact that I was seeing it come out of a live action person, mm-hmm. like I was just so flabbergasted by it that I wasn't even registering who the voice was. But, because that's her voice. Yeah, that is. I, I know. I've heard her voice in other things before, but they've all been like voice acted. It's weird because actually for me... I think she's like one of the Simpsons cast members that I haven't heard the voice and other voice acting things. Maybe I have, but I don't remember. But I do remember her in live action stuff. Well, speaking of... When it comes to uh, the actress whose name is... Yardley uh, Smith. Yardley Smith, yeah. who's the voice of Lisa Simpson. Yeah. I've seen her in other things where she plays like nebbish, meek, or all kind of accountant type ladies or secretaries. And I'm like, hey, it's Lisa. Yeah. There's... um. Speaking of Monsters, Inc. alumni, the other main actor from that film, John Goodman, he was in We're Back, A Dinosaur Story. She was in that as well. Oh, there you are. She says the line, let no bad happen. (laughs) Did she say it like that? Well, she was crying while saying it. I I, I had a particular laugh out loud experience during that whole entire affair. It was just one of those where I was like, oh, God, it just keeps getting worse and worse as soon as she comes in. Just you instantly know, <laughs> and the wife's facial expressions, like the eyebrows, she's got the very intense makeup mm. and the hair and everything. And I, I'm a big Daniel Stern fan. I love that guy. When you get him to yell or say like almost profanities, like you don't even need him to swear to get the feeling across. That's why him and Joe Pesci in <laughs> Home Alone is just one of the greatest things because they're both in children's a children's movie but you know that these actors will swear but they don't <laughs> get to you know Joe Pesci's known for 
saying fuck every third word in a sentence or motherfuck or some profanity and same with Daniel Stern but in he, say, Alone, he says oh fuck and then he gets killed <laughs> yeah and then but here in, in in this movie he doesn't get to swear properly either but you you just the way that he delivers lines makes it so you don't even need him to say fuck you get the emphasis of what a fuck would be you get quite a lot of the other big swear word the shit word well yeah bullshit and all shit's that. fine Shit's fine. Shit's completely okay. Well, yeah. well they, they tell themselves that. They, they 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 can't say cunt or fuck in this movie, okay? They have to leave that for very bad things. But, uh, yeah, I had a great time. I had some uh, genuine... I forgot how the movie opened. That was one of those things. I was like, the movie opens, and I'm like, what is going on? This isn't a treasure hunting film. Uh, yeah, I, I remember the, the, the bit after that, where you just have his life billy crystals is his birthday his parents ring him yeah the one year later yeah i remember that more than that uh prologue i guess and so i was like oh this is a unique experience and i remember this mm. uh but uh to talk about some of the things that also work about this uh, you know having seen this many times myself the thing that really rang for me on this particular watch, and I'm curious to hear if this did stand out for you as a first-time viewer, mm-hmm. even before having to read trivia, there are just moments, lines of dialogue, exchanges, monologues, or comedic scenes that feel real. Mm-hmm. Like, this feels like this is ripped from somebody's life. Such as the Billy Crystal's parents phoning him at like five o'clock in the morning and reenacting, the, like telling him about the birth and wishing him all that stuff. And I'm like, this is funny, but it's funny in a way where I could believe this would happen to somebody. The, the There's fa- lots the, of those moments. The there. fact that his character was like miming along with it, like beat for beat, that element, I would say, added to that effect. Oh, if yeah. it wasn't for that, I would just think like, oh, this is you know, funny written thing. Yeah, and the wife also reacting to it, uh, mm. even though she's just overhearing it on the phone. She's knows she knows what this is all about. But there was many moments of, I guess, comedy like that where they aren't the gut busting laugh out loud moments like the the scenes you were talking about, where there's that heightened thing of these ice cream men pretending like acting like they're who've been very cowboys. pleasant up to this point, but this is like now serious business. <laughs> but you have those scenes such as when Billy Crystal's talking about like this memory he had about seeing a baseball game and you're like this feels Mm. super specific and even if you don't feel that you at least feel the authenticity and the genuine nature of it within the narrative of this movie those Mm. were the moments that really hit for me what about you yeah they i didn't necessarily think that like oh these are literal moments but they definitely felt inspired like whoever wrote them you know has lived a life and that they, they would be based on something. So the fact that they were like one for one Billy Crystal's experiences was quite surprising. Um, Cause I remembered in the opening credits, it said that he was like the producer. I didn't realize that he also wrote the film mm. apparently. So if I knew that I'd be like, Oh, well there you go. <laughs> he makes contributions in ways. Uh, because why I bring this up is this isn't just a comedy where it's about laughs, laugh, 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 laugh. Like this isn't uh, Freddy Got Fingered, right? Where Freddy Got Fingered exists just to have one joke, one gag after the other, or to to tie this into something that we've also done on the podcast that uh, is also of a of a piece genre wise, uh, the Pale Face with Bob Hope, where you have that wacky comedian who's always got his zingers up the wazoo, and you throw him in a scenario, and you get them to do what they do. This is Billy Crystal's The Pale Face, but not really, because it is in a movie that just exists to be gag set pieces after the other. And I was just curious if that was an expectation for you at all, when you see the pitch of the movie being a bunch of funny city folk go out to be cowboys, hijinks ensue. It doesn't really play out exactly like that, but was that anywhere in your brain when uh, engaging with the film to begin with? So Sorry, to, just to basically summarise what you're saying, like, have this film just be a vehicle for them to do the thing they do? Yeah, like, this movie isn't just a vehicle for just jokes, hmm. where the the movie could easily be... Isn't it funny that we have these three wacky city folk characters doing rough and tumble cowboy things? But there's more to it than just 
those gags. Like there is a genuine dramatic thread through it of these characters having arcs about finding yeah, themselves. The fact that we have so many genuine moments, like I wouldn't have seen it playing out like that. And even walking in, you know, because I didn't really have, you know, all the all the right expectations. No, I wasn't really thinking that. And certainly, re- pardon me, reading the trivia, and it mentioned like basically all three of the leads had like other actors that they were considering for the role. Mm-hmm. It's like that was really interesting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just emphasize this because... One of them was Dan Aykroyd, so he oh. same year as Nothing But Trouble. <laughs> Why I bring it up is I, I do think that this specific type of comedy is lacking in terms of mainstream Hollywood nowadays, because I do think a lot of the mainstream Hollywood films that are the comedies are either those, like, it's got to be undercut and laugh a minute, like laugh a second, bam, 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 gag, 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 joke, set piece, comedic, blah. Or you have your Judd Apatow movie where it's like long improv sessions and sometimes it has like an emotional yeah, core that just I... like whiffs up in the air at you and go, oh, I guess the 40-year-old virgin is now a sincere movie, I guess. like, Yeah, I guess in terms of like those comedies where it's really inspired by a specific person, I think these days would be fair to say it's more so on like the director or the writer rather than the actors themselves. Like, do we really have many comedians today who have like specific bits that they do? Uh... Or like specific types of comedy? I mean... Yeah, I mean, I could, I can imagine. Might be a bit too general of a statement. Yeah, so. I mean, you have your Seth Rogen. Yeah, <laughs> stoner comedy man. Uh, he's Pumper. But yeah, I know what you're saying. But like, what I'm circling to is this isn't just a comedy film that's just here to be a comedy. It is a comedy film that wants to take the characters and us, the viewers, on an mm. emotional journey where Billy Crystal starts out as this cynic this depressive character and by the end he's like this happy-go-lucky guy who now has a pet calf and he's going to take it home in the back of their minivan or whatever and they're (laughs) like what the hell is going on here this is why i think city slickers endures after all of these years it just has that universal appeal where Mm. it isn't undermining itself because it's just a comedy film. It has all of the Billy Crystal things, like him talking smack about Curly, and he's like, oh, he's behind me, isn't he? And then he turns around and gives that big, cheesy Billy Crystal smile that he does all the time. But Mm. you also then have the birthing of the calf sequence where that's played straight. Like, that's a sincere scene. He even has a moment that could have been played for more drama where Curly shoots the cow and Billy Crystal freaks out about it but then Curly explains himself and Billy Crystal understands like you could in a in a in a comedy film or a drama really milk just that for something else but they just let it go because that's not what this is about this is about this tender experience that these men have gone on in this uh just little side journey in the story right a plus use of the word milk yeah. <laughs> yeah, we also had the moment at the end of the film where it's revealed that the cows are going to be sent for slaughter and like that's not I don't think that was really played for laughs no. but and but that's like the note that that whole story ends on so it's like this really weird like downer that they throw out there and then they just move on from it. <laughs> Well, you have the dentists. Uh I know the son pitch like could we get an egg? Like could we <laughs> Well, yeah, that's that's like, you know, trying to end an uplifting note, like, oh, more adventure in the future, right? Well, not with these cows. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but it's also not played as super saccharine and yeah. sad. It's but, just but like, like, that's how it is, guys. But just, like, reading how that line was, like, delivered and everyone's reactions and all the filmmaking, like, camera stuff, it felt like in another movie, like, oh, this is the moment where we, we will free the cows and let them roam into the countryside. Mm-hmm. But no, the film just moves on from that. It's like, okay. Nope. nope. I'm, I... I'm happy that it didn't go in that direction. Did you note down who the director was? Uh, Underwood, right? Ron, Ron Underwood. Who... Oh, we've heard that name before, haven't we? Tremors. Tremors. Which lines up with the overall aesthetic of the films are both set in the rough and tumble yeah. area. You have a filmmaker who knows how to shoot those rocky, dusty locations and have uh, these action-y moments with like animals running around. Obviously, in Tremors, it's like these big worm props, but you have to have that. And then the other one was Heart and Souls, the oh. Robert Downey Jr. 
comedy drama. Thing. Right, that and was him as well. Once you know that, now that and I didn't, I didn't remember that it was this director either. But when I looked at his IMDb, I went, of course, of course, you can see how those two other films we've watched on the pod. Uh, from the same director as this one, you can you Defin- can see that definitely Heart and Souls because I remember in Heart and Souls, like the you know to use the word in the title, the heart of that film was something that really stuck out there, and mm-hmm. this film had a kind of similar kind of heart. And I think with Tremors, how that movie was bolstered up by all of these amazing little supporting characters yeah. who were very quickly and easily defined and didn't take up too much screen time away from the main players of the story but you got that sense of the ensemble cast where when, you could yeah. say i like this one and i love that one and i hate that guy and blah with relative ease yeah, when we were being introduced to like all the supporting players on the trip it, that did kind of feel like it there's like oh, okay these are kind of distinctive this is their deal mm-hmm. this is their deal this is a woman who was meant to have a partner come with her but you know, mm-hmm. was alone and you do get little bits of development from them throughout the film. Yeah, I can definitely see that now. I my uh, my favorite in our cast was uh, played by the actor Bruno Kirby, who was uh, oh, what's the character's name? The one with the mustache. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I Ed? yeah, I really liked him. He was one where. You got a certain feeling of like what archetype this guy was going to be as a person, as a character. He was the more, he was the goofy one. You got the feeling of, oh, he's the bubbly, energetic, optimistic, I'm up for everything. And he's just a bit of a, a thicky, an airhead, if you will. But mm. they, they, they peel away at the layers of that character where he delivers probably my favorite dramatic sequence in the movie where they do the talking about the best days and the worst days of their life. Yeah, that was a really good one. And his best day and his worst day are the same day about how he had to stand up to his father and kick him out and the father never came back and then he had to look after his mother and his siblings and uh, mm. it's it was played yeah, he straight. Didn't, he didn't go into specifically like what were what the worst parts of there was, but you can you can feel it. Well, yeah, it, 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 but you know that the things that made it good were also the things that made it upsetting. You know, mm. it is the it's great that I got rid of my father from my life, but also it's sad that I had to get rid of my father from my life. Mm. It's yeah. When when I was reading up about the film afterwards, and some some sentence I can't remember what website, but it described that scene and it phrased it as like. Oh, he described it also as the worst day of his life because he never saw his father again. I'm like, oh yeah, that that's sad. But like my immediate, you know, read on when he mentioned it was the same day was like, oh man, like after that experience, there must have been like something unspeakable that happened, or mm. or you know, just misery in the house or something like that. So yeah, just any way you think about it, it's like you yeah. know, plays with the imagination. It is a thing that I look at as it is the best thing because now we can move on. This 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 trauma within the family can be resolved, but also at the same time, it is it the dissolution. It is yeah. the dissolution of the status of you know the the ideal of the family. I mean, I mean, you can to a minor extent understand that as as somebody who's you know uh, from a family of divorce and stuff, and mm. you've talked about that on the pod occasionally, and it's one of those things where it's like it's hard to wrap your brain around that when you're when you're younger. But imagine you're forced to go through a lot of change, yeah, yeah. But imagine you're him, where you have to step up now as the father of the house and look after everybody, including your own mother. That's like, mm. that's a lot. But uh, he he delivered it with uh, absolute sincerity and uh, what a great performance. He was my favorite performance mm. in the movie. He's the one I'm least familiar with as an actor too. So I didn't have him pigeonholed as easily as the well, others. Well, I looked him up and he was in Stuart Little. So, you know, he's good. He was a son of uh, Bruce Kirby, who was a very well-known character actor. He was in Columbo all the time as like one of the Sh- Joe Schmo policemen that Columbo would talk to, and his mm-hmm. father out- outlived him, unfortunately, and he died a few uh... years ago in his 90s. 
So it's just like, well, uh, well, Bruno, he died in 2006, 57 uh, from cancer, I'm pretty sure. But uh, him and Billy Crystal had done a few movies when Harry met Sally. Mm. Big one, of course. Yeah, I, I like the scene um, in this film where uh, when the two friends uh, decide, oh, we, we'll herd the, the cattle, you guys just, you, you guys can go. Mm. Billy Crystal was, you know, trying to argue back to them by saying, well, this is what you're implying. Like, you want me to go with you and just, what was his name, Bruce Kirby? Uh, Bruno. Bruno. Bruno Kirby uh, just yelled back at him, like, I'm not asking you to come. And, like, I just feel like in another film, like, that underlying uh, implication would be a bit more overt. The fact that in this film, like, he, he was genuinely, you know, saying, like, I'm not asking you to come. I felt like that was kind of a breath of fresh air. Oh, it was. Uh, there's many familiar faces, uh, whether they are of uh, big names or small names, uh, people who would go on to be things, or people mm. who were working legends like Jack Jack Palance. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to Cookie. Uh, he is one of those actors that's in everything, and he's a part of. Uh, I guess the group that is uh, Dan, uh, Danny DeVito, uh, Michael Douglas, Jack Nicholson, and uh, Christopher Lloyd, where those guys all got their starts with each other around the same area uh, and same period of time. And uh, this guy, Cookie, he was in Batman 1989. He was, uh, you've seen Batman 1989, correct? Uh, he, Mike, first, yeah, first yes. Michael Keaton one. Yeah, I've seen, yes. He's, yes. he's, he's Bob the Joker's right-hand man, and uh, he's the one that gets just offhandedly shot by Jack Nicholson. He's like, you let me down, Bob. Can I have a gun? And he just grabs it and shoots him. And he's like, just in everything, uh, uh, Tracy Walter. He's one of those actors where people often overlook him, but he's always around, always doing bits and bobs. And Cookie was one of my personal favorite little side characters, him getting drunk and <laughs> drawing a smiley face on his ass and... Just going around being, and he was exactly like Jack with Jack Palance, the kind of guy where you you just you feel the authenticity of this person being a part of this environment. Where Jack Palance, he was obviously cast because he was an old fashioned cowboy. He was right up there. He was in Shane, one of the great westerns, and so, and that was one where he was nominated for an Oscar and probably should have won it then. But uh, you know, Tracy Walter, he's one of those character actors that's always overlooked but uh when you place him in something like this he just he just belongs so much that you don't even think about it you just go yeah that guy's cookie <laughs> uh what, what about you there was some uh familiar faces popping up through this any in particular that you were happy to see and any that were a surprise so the 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 bigger of the two ice cream brothers i'm like i I've seen you in something before. When he had the hat on, I'm like, I, I can't recognize him. And I looked up his name afterwards, and I saw his last his name's like Josh Mostel or something mm -hmm. like that. I'm like Mostel. I've that that sounds familiar. And I looked him up on Wikipedia, and he's the son of Zero Mostel uh -huh. from the producer. I'm like, oh wow, oh I remember we did the producer, so I recognize the last name. Mm -hmm. And then I saw that he was in Jesus Christ Superstar, and I was like, oh wait. Yep. That, that means he was also in Billy Madison. He was the principal mm -hmm. in that. Yep. So it was he's not a big daddy too. Yeah, yeah. So it's not only that I recognize him, but I learned that he was related to Zero Mostel, which yeah. I didn't know. That was interesting. He was in Big Daddy. And you know who was in Big Daddy as the kid? Oh, what's his name? Uh, it was both of them. It was both, both the, of them, yeah. Zach and Cody. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Sweet Life of Zach and Cody, which relates to City Slickers. Uh, how familiar are you with Sweet Life and Z of Zack and Cody? Not my, I think I've seen part of well, an episode once. Rachel lost her mind. My wife lost her mind because the, 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 the dentists, the son dentist is Mosby from uh, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. He's, uh, he works at the hotel and he's a very uh, 
famous character from that. There's memes of his face. He just has a very okay. expressive face as a whole uh, episode that's pretty famous where he's, uh, I do believe he's teaching one of the main characters how to drive. And he just has these outrageous reactions to how terrible they are at it. But I wanted to give uh, him a shout out because I, I knew him. I was like, I knew this guy. I never watched Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. I never, I never had cable for it. But I, I knew that face because of the internet. It just uh, tells you sometimes of like these beloved figures like here in Australia it's like Bob Ross and Mr. Rogers means nothing to us but we both know who they are the, the, the funny thing with the Mr. Rogers thing is like every, when I'd first learnt about him it was like through parodies where mm-hmm. they were doing the thing of like oh look how mean this guy is like oh this must be like some mean character from some famous show but then I found out like oh no it's just this like really sincere sweet person yeah <laughs> Uh, Jeffrey Tambor plays uh, Billy Crystal's boss. He's in a bunch of stuff. He was the the father, the uh, the patriarch of uh, the family in Arrested Development, the one that's in prison. He's a mm-hmm. uh, pop pop. <laughs> and uh, Jeffrey Tambor was uh, in a. He's in a ton of things. He was in the Hangover movies as well, where uh, he has that famous line. Uh, what was it like? Um, Something about, like, you know, what stays in Vegas. You know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, except for STDs. Those come back with you. So be careful. (laughs) The big cast one that really shocked me was Jake Gyllenhaal's in this film, one of the actors that I really love. (laughs) Yes, he was was here, and I didn't even recognize him. I did not, because he was seven years old or something, nine years old. I knew he was in it because I, I saw his name. And uh, in the IMDb's and uh, just listed in somewhere. And I'm like, oh, I'll keep an eye out for him. Because I thought he'll look exactly like Jake Gyllenhaal. Because I've seen Jake Gyllenhaal as a teenager in uh, Donnie Darko. And he looks like Jake Gyllenhaal. But, uh, His voice was so high. I just didn't recognize <laughs> him. I didn't recognize him no. at all. After I read that he was in it, I went back and I'm like, oh, I can kind of see it now. The other ice cream brother, that's the one I knew more. He looked more. familiar too. Da- David David Pamer, uh, he is just, he's in everything. And uh Billy Crystal and him work together in a lot of things. He's just, he's in a ton of shows. He's a, he's a, one of those guys where he'll do TV shows, movies, big, small roles, whatever you need him to do, he'll do it. He's always pretty funny. He plays, again, those kind of nebbish roles that you saw here. And uh, recently he was in an episode of Star Trek Picard, my favorite television show ever. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I mean this, this statement sincerely. I don't mean that it's my favorite television show. I hate it. Uh, he plays a doctor character, and he's uh, an old friend of Picard's, and I genuinely like that character and performance, and I wanted him to be one of the main cast members of the show, but he only existed as a exposition dump character in the early days to tell us that Picard is dying. And it was one of those where the role itself was nothing, but you cast an actor with a certain look and cadence and experience and it brings it to life so much that i was genuinely disappointed that we didn't see more of him well in a show called picard did you really have room for a character who's supposed to be friend of picard no we no 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 (laughs) No, in that show he has no friends everybody hates him that's weird too everyone's like stupid fucking picard there's an admiral who defines picard as a man filled with fucking sheer fucking hubris and i'm like what picard (laughs) You know you're talking about Picard, right? Does the Doctor friend like Picard? Yes, he does. That's why I liked him. Okay, too. well then there's, there's then there's no room for a friend of Picard who likes him in the show called Picard. I guess <laughs> is Picard the show that has the one that goes shut the fuck up? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's the same lady. She a fucking hubris. She was the oh. the wife in um, Small Soldiers. Oh, cool. yes, and I remember bringing that up then. But uh, yeah, there's there's a few interesting uh, acting people. The uh, the woman that was by herself at the ranch, she was a Supergirl. That's Helen Slater. She's had a very long and vast career, but she keeps coming back to play variants of Superman characters. She's in Supergirl, the television show. Okay, and she was in Smallville as uh, as yeah again playing. Kryptonian people, so very. She's a good actress. She's always great to see. She was one of my favorite of the uh, the minor characters, the ensemble here, because uh, 
they didn't play her up in the way that they did initially, where it's like, oh, she's the sexy lady that we've got to ogle. They they moved away from that very, very quickly after a while. They had some gags about it, but then they just let her be a genuine person, and uh, the, the, that was nice. Yeah, the, the fact that she was the only woman of the group, um, it didn't... At, at first, it felt kind of like token, like the token mm-hmm. woman, but they did actually use it for some interesting stuff. Like, I've already complimented, like, the baseball conversation where, mm. you know, she brought up the thing that, you know, people who aren't into baseball might relate with. Or like, why do you guys always talk about baseball? And then it led to, like, a discussion where, you know, the guy said, like, well, look, we've had problems connecting with people in our lives, and baseball has always been something that has been a really easy bonding thing. And she gives this very sincere reaction of, like, hmm, yeah, I understand that. And even I was, like, feeling myself going along with her. She uh, also was the only real person who understood the gravity of saving the cattle. Uh, she mm. wasn't mm, yeah, she, flippant about it. Yeah, and, she and the guy you liked had a really good back and forth about that. Yeah, and uh, well, like, it, it came yeah. from honest places of those characters. It didn't feel contrived to me. Yeah, it didn't feel like... Because at first I heard the line that that character said and it felt like, oh, that's a bit of a, like an antagonistic line. Mm. But the way that like they, you know followed along from that they reached an understanding of like yeah this these are like sincere feelings he's not trying to be a bad guy or anything yeah the only and it's not a contrivance but it's just a necessity of the script because we're following our three men Mm. i i don't believe that she would have just gone back to the ranch i think she would have helped them I, i i do think that with all sincerity in my heart i i it was one of those where it's like we can't have her there because of the arc and the theme considering that her, but her I, gut I, feeling was to help so. and she was also the most competent in the group when it came to you know rustling and riding horses i just i went okay this is when the movies being the the uh, the safe Hollywood comedy film. Yeah, I mean, there's the other version where all of them do it. Like every single person joins in, even against their own reservations. Like they all have like the Billy Crystal thing of like, mm. oh, they they come over the horizon to help out the problem that just came up. But uh, <laughs> that was just a minor thing for me that just now that you mentioned briefly it, yeah. took away from my enjoyment of the end. But. Uh, that and I did roll my eyes when I'm like, okay, we're just gonna expect Norman to make it over this river. <laughs> you, you stupid Billy Crystal. I, I can't remember if I was thinking it at the time, but when I saw Norman was being carried away by the the river, I was like, oh, that makes sense. They should have thought of this. <laughs> yes, yes, they should have thought of this. They're cowboys at this point. I'm not. They should have thought of this. They should have thought of this. <laughs> Anything else you want to bring up in particular? Uh, uh, Jack Jack Palance, I guess? We yeah. should bring him up. Uh, since this is the first time viewing for you, uh, what did you think of him in this and uh, how they handled his character? Yeah, he was almost as good as he was in Mr. Scarface, but let's <laughs> let's focus on the positives here. He was actually in the movie, unlike in <laughs> Tango and Cash. Oh, that's right, he was in that as well. You know, here's another thing I'll, I'll just give credit. He's not in the movie much, Jack mm. Palance. He's not in the movie much. If anything, he's probably equal, maybe a little bit more than he was in Tango and Cash. But the difference is how you actually use the fucking actor in your movie. What, you mean have him interact with the main cast? And also have a purpose. Yeah. Like, clearly defined purpose. But Ryan, character. he was the main villain in Tango and Cash. Playing Isn't that rats purposeful? all the time. <laughs> That's right, he had rats, I forgot. And that. he rubbed them on his face. <laughs> he did. <laughs> uh, but uh, what did you think of uh, Curly? So, to be honest, I'm not too familiar with Jack Palance, um, outside of the things that we've done on the podcast. So I guess me jumping to conclusions, I kind of looked at him, saw that he somewhat, but not quite like resembles, uh, Clint Eastwood, who is, I do have an idea of being like a bit more of a grumpy kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And I think I might've projected that onto him. Okay. Even like unfairly, because he wasn't really like that in Mr. Scarface or Tango and Cash. So seeing, in those films, he was bad guys. He was he was one, bad he guys. Was yeah, not a bad guy. But he he wasn't like a Clint Eastwood character. So like seeing him in this film and like for all the talk that Billy Crystal and the others have, like oh man, this guy's so scary. He's all smiles pretty much, and mm-hmm. he's clearly like having fun with a lot of it. It's a don't judge a book by its cover. Yeah, don't judge a book by its cover. Like I actually was really thrown off where like after he saved Billy Crystal's life. 
And then Billy Crystal's like, that's the manliest person I've ever met in my life. Like, I thought that was like a positive interaction. Then like the next time he's talking about Curly and he's like, oh, this guy's so scary. He's going to kill us. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, I-, I thought you liked him. Yeah. Well, Billy Crystal's character is very flippant like that. I-, I-, I rather enjoyed the knife scene where he's mm. sharpening his knife and Billy Crystal just lays it out and he's playing his harmonica and you have... The, that's the turning point, right? Where 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 Curly sits next to him, and then he starts singing, mm. and all of that, and it was just such a, a tender moment. I am a bit more familiar with this actor and his his career. He was um okay. So to put it in a context that's a little bit understandable for you and maybe for some of our listeners out there, he was a golden age actor. He was there in the fifties, uh, and he was in. Great films, uh, you know, westerns and dramas, and he got his career start because he punched Marlon Brando in the nose and broke his nose, and he was his understudy in uh, A Streetcar Named Desire. On no stage. shit. Because uh, they were boxing. Uh, he had put up something to box, and Marlon Brando was like, come on, let's train together. And he accidentally missed and hit Marlon Brando, broke oh, his nose. it was an accident. Yeah, it was right. an accident, right. but <laughs> it launched his career because then he got noticed, he got an agent, bam, went to the races in Hollywood, and he climbed through the ranks. And uh, he was just a guy where he should have got more recognition for what he was. So he was in Shane, one of the great westerns of all time that has been riffed and uh, recontextualized and homaged and all those things many times over the years. He was nominated. He should have won. It's always he, he was. It's one of those, one of the earliest examples. Right up there was Citizen Kane, where it's like they should have won an Oscar, but they <laughs> didn't. And it's like you forget that it's like Saving Private Ryan never won an Oscar. They didn't win the Best Picture Oscar, and you go, really? That doesn't feel right. What did Shakespeare in Love? Has anyone even watched Shakespeare in Love in the last 20 years? But um, he was in runnings for movies where, okay, so like certain directors, certain big directors literally promised him that they were going to put him in their movies and then they went with a, a different actor and then that actor got an Oscar for that role and then oh. so it's like just keeps happening and just... Eventually, he faded into what we saw with Mr. Scarface. I was going to say, the fact that he was so, like a Western actor in one of those mm-hmm. Italian films, mm-hmm. kind of like in... Uh, Once, Once Upon, Upon a Time, Time in Hollywood. Hollywood. That's what I was going to say. Or for people who are fans of Red Letter Media, uh, Cameron Mitchell, who was an old-fashioned cowboy, and he had to do these low-rent movies. And that was Jack Palance, where you look at his IMDb before and after City Slickers, he was just doing these straight-to-video, Italian, whatever jobs you can get, because he was an older, fallen star. In fact, we even talked about this when we did Ed Wood with uh, um, Martin Landau, right? That was the guy who was in Ed Wood. Yeah, oh, that? yes, yes. That was his career, where he was like this prestigious actor, and then for... A decade or so, he was having to do these shitty movies, and then Ed Wood helped revive his career again. And and, and in real life and in the film, like Bela Lugosi was kind of going through that as well, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, Bela Lugosi was, you know... He was like, oh, I'm going to be a vampire on this TV show that's going to mm. make fun of me or something. Yeah, and so that was his career. So Billy Crystal wanted him for this role because it's like, he's the guy, he's obviously... And if we can't get him, we'll maybe go for Charles Bronson, another actor, or maybe Clint Eastwood. And so, But, yeah, to me, I really enjoyed him here because he has that lived-in experience. You know that this is a guy who was this guy, you know, like whether it was in his real personal life or he's played this character many times in his career. And I don't mean that in a, dispar- a disparaging way, but in a way where it's like, if anything people like him made the image of what Curly is in cinema. Mm -hmm. So it was logical to have him be Curly. And uh, yeah, he won an Oscar for it. Whether he deserved it for that, uh, who's to say? But he got one anyway, and it was something that would have meant a lot to him. And uh, yeah, he was wonderful in this. Honestly, after all you said, like it kind of fits a bit more because it almost feels like not only was it the performance, but also what it represented. And he was a pain in the ass. 
Uh, he was known for being very volatile on sets, including on this movie, where on the first day, him and the director got into a heated, heated argument, and Billy Crystal asked him why, what was the argument about, and he just said, oh, I don't know, just first day jitters. First day jitters, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's many stories of actors back in the golden age that worked with him that told, said that he was the most fearsome actor they've ever met. They, they were f- like physically scared of him. Like they were worried that he would hurt them because he was just so, and he was one of like, uh, one of the first method actors in Hollywood as well. Jeez, right I'm... up there. Well, that's why him and Marlon Brando came up together around the same time. And if, if he's scary in like a normal role, imagine like on the set of Mr. Scarface when he had mm-hmm. that scar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He punched out Burt Lancaster and then Burt Lancaster punched him back so hard in the gut it made him throw up. Uh, yeah, because he was so in the role of being a badass. He's but, very different to James Franco. And that's why it was frustrating to watch a movie like Tango and Cash, mm. where it's like, okay, you get this guy. I just told you who he is. He's the bad guy in your Stallone movie. He's like, oh, that sounds awesome. And then they proceed to not do anything with him he's by himself acting against a fucking rat and we praised him though we praised for a guy who's given literally nothing to do he's working so hard to give us something and that was the film that had the trivia point where like he was really upset that he like didn't Mm -hmm. even get to meet Mm -hmm. like kurt russell and sylvester stallone yeah 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 imagine that but uh here he is in this Probably the same amount of screen time, uh, but instead it's all condensed into... Yeah, it's more consistent. Like, once he's on screen, he's, like, every scene until he's out. Yeah, well, in Tango and Cash, he's he's sprinkled throughout the entire movie. Mm. But uh, it's just how you use an actor and actually use a character as well. Uh, Yeah, that's all I have to say about City Slickers. Nothing else is coming to my mind. It's just a, a pleasant time. Norman is cute as hell. Norman was cute as hell. Uh, very, I, rem- I remember a couple of a couple of years ago, uh, my mum went on a trip to India, and when she came back, she was really obsessed with cows mm. because in India, cows are you know sacred, and oh, they yeah. just very casually wander through the streets and mm. into shops, and people you know treat them with respect. And mm. I was like, oh, that's a funny animal to really like, but uh, you know what? This film, cows are pretty nice. Bartek licks his lips and grabs a <laughs> fork and knife out. Pretty nice. Yeah. Uh, I pick them and up and then I put them down. And it's funny the because Lisa was in the movie and it makes me think about Lisa becoming a vegetarian. Uh, <laughs> That's why Lisa became a vegetarian. Oh, from one magical animal. Lisa. It wasn't. It wasn't the Beatles that were like, no, you have to make a permanently vegetarian. No, it was this film, <laughs> City Slickers. But uh, that is it. Uh, I recommend City Slickers. I think it holds up. It doesn't have too many dated qualities. And it is a little long. That is my problem. It's a little long. And it does have a very formulaic quality to it. But it, it, like I said, it's one of those ones where it earns that. It, it, go, it excels at what it is. So I recommend City Slickers. No, for sure. I also recommend this film. Um if you were like me and you hadn't seen the film yet, you should watch it because we said at the beginning of this episode, they don't quite make comedies like this anymore. No. So it'll be a breath of fresh air, even though it's older than us. Uh, so you are recommending the movie for next episode, Bartek. It yep. is an American pick for you, a yeah. Hollywood film, yeah. or at yes. least one made by We're the going... United States. Yes, America. We're going very exotic this time, Ryan. We're going to America. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, that's where our spin-off podcast is based. Yes, our spin-off podcast, Chats, a television podcast hosted by Magellan and Alan. Uh, we trust them yes. to do the job correctly. Well, right. Sometimes they let us down by uh, not doing uh, shows about shows I like, but that's fine. They, they one day they could do space above and beyond, but not today. <laughs> uh, but Magellan, thank you for the recommendation. I was literally about to say that. Thank you, Magellan. He hasn't seen the film. Last I heard, he just recommended it because oh. he said it sounds interesting. I want to hear your thoughts on it. So you heard our thoughts, Magellan. Watch the movie yourself, <laughs> Mister. Hey, Magellan, I have a counter recommendation. Check out City Slickers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, what is your recommendation for next week? Um, I'm also going with a '90s comedy. Oh, I'm going with Mouse Hunt. Mouse Hunt, Mouse Hunt. Good. I was thinking about Mouse Hunt uh, fairly recently. There was an actor that shows up in that movie that I saw in something. I was like, hey, it's that guy from Mouse Hunt. So mm. we'll get to uh, have a little bit more of a discussion about that next time. 
Uh, it has uh, that's uh, Nathan Lane, right? Yes, and, another um, another Stuart Little alumni, uh, yeah. alumnus rather, and uh, also a producers alumnus. So because he was in the remake of the producers. He was. Oh, the, right, right. He was the Zero Mistel yeah. character. Well, the, look at all these references. See, yeah. Connections, I mean. Connections and references. And mm. uh, and he was Timon, opposite of Seth Rogen's Pumba. Imagine, <laughs> imagine if they did that. Uh, somebody out there has spliced together the voice cast the of original the original Timon, and the new but one. The new Pumba. <laughs> and oh, there's somebody out there who put the original voices to the animation of the new one and it looks yeah. fucking they, weird. They picked their favourite uh, actor for each character from the two versions. Mm-hmm. Whoopi Goldberg gets to stay, but Cheech Marin, he's out. <laughs> um, but okay, Mouse Hunt, next episode. Uh, give it a watch, people. Give it a look over. But until next time, you can find us on uh, social on social medias of Facebook, and if Twitter still is ex- in existence after we publish this, Twitter as well under Spit and Polish Presents. This is in the description of the episode, as well as our email address, which is Spit and Polished at Gmail dot com. Feel free to drop us recommendations or just your opinions on things that we've talked about here. I would love to hear from you if you have not rated and reviewed the podcast. Why? Why haven't you done that? You have... We gave you all the clues. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Listening Person. (laughs) Mr. Listening Person, we gave you all the clues. (laughs) Uh, but that is... That's a it. reference to The Snowman, guys. What a film that was, The Snowman. We all we yeah. all loved it. We've done it on Pictures Power. I think it's one of our longest Pictures Powers. And it deserved it, because that film has too <laughs> many layers. Uh, in, that, in that episode, there was a point near the end where you asked me, like, is there anything else to say? And because it was going on for so long and I was tired... I said no with a little bit too much desperation in my voice, and I've and I've always been embarrassed by that. I'm gonna now grab that and amplify it and do it as an audio drop in every episode that we do. No, here it is right uh, now, guys. I just wanted to confirm, <laughs> Mouse Hunt, the dad who opens the movie, it's his funeral, is William Hickey, that actor I love so much from uh, Major Pain. He was the the head of the school there, the guy covered in moths, and uh, he was in My Blue Heaven as the the old gangster guy that was in witness protection uh, owning the pet store. The one with that that voice, mm. yeah, he doesn't, Polly. He doesn't say Polly. When I was looking, cracker. When I was looking up the cast list, I saw that name. I'm like, I've heard that. I, I, I can hear this name being said by Ryan's voice, but where? where what was he in? Yeah, so there we'll we see go. William Hickey next week. Until next time, people, Paul, he doesn't want a cracker. That's a My Blue Heaven reference. Ryan, ask me a question that I'm going to answer no to. Are you happy? No. Nope.